Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's program was brought to you by El Cortez. Stop in for tacos and tiki drinks at 17 Ingraham Street in Bushwick, or visit them online at elcortezbushwick.com. Hi guys, I'm Jamie Oliver, and you're listening to Heritage Radio Network, a member-supported podcast network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. This year, HRN is celebrating 10 years of food radio. How amazing. For the past decade, they've been taking you behind the scenes of farms, restaurants, breweries, school cafeterias, and so much more. It's been 10 years, and they're just getting started. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. I'm Luke Griffin, and you're listening to Bushwick Podcast. Local stories like you've never heard before. Each week, we take you behind the scenes of the artists, activists, and entrepreneurs whose journeys collide in Bushwick, Brooklyn's most dynamic neighborhood. This week, we're kicking off a new season from our new home on Heritage Radio Network. HRN is an independent, member-supported nonprofit based right here in Bushwick. And for the past decade, it's been the world's leading source for amazing audio about food and culture. We couldn't be more excited to join the HRN family and help share Bushwick's incredible stories with listeners down the block and across the globe. We're opening this season with a special story, a candid look back at the first year in a couple's journey to pursue their dream of opening a restaurant together. It was extreme. It was like we went from zero to a hundred in so many different ways and and opening day probably should have been the most joyous, most proud moment in our lives, but it was the scariest. Because we were like, what, what, where are we even open? It's Thursday, May 9th, and this episode is called Big Humble. It's never been a more competitive time to be a restaurant in Bushwick. The community has always been home to great food, but over the past few years, Bushwick has seen a remarkable influx of diverse eateries. It seems like on every block, a new fast casual concept or hole-in-the-wall dinner restaurant is opening up. And at any given moment in 2019, Bushwick residents are only a walk away from their choice of takeout tikka masala or a Michelin-starred Italian dinner. But behind every new restaurant in Bushwick's culinary renaissance is a team. And behind every team is a journey. For one new restaurant in Bushwick, that journey is, perhaps more than anything, about the power of food to transform strangers into family and challenges into opportunities. Which, in a way, seems fitting for a place whose menu reads something like if a distinguished kitchen played the greatest hits of grandmas from around the world. There's everything from baked mac and cheese that bubbles over with a chewy crust to a massive plate of chicken parmesan and homemade marinara sauce, to freshly fried West Indian fritters and Argentinian-style empanadas. It's an eclectic mix that the owners call global comfort food, and alongside cocktails and desserts like fried apple pie, it's available now at a restaurant that, for a growing community of devotees, is becoming a new Bushwick staple. 
Finding the restaurant is easy because the address is right there in the name, 191 Knickerbocker. Last June, shortly after the restaurant opened, we got an invitation from Rona Davis, who, alongside her husband Jesse, co-owns 191 Knickerbocker. My name is Rona Davis. I am um, owner-operator. I'm married to the chef, who's also owner-operator. And um, we are a comfort food joint, and um, we're pretty chill, laid back, and it's kind of a family affair here. Rona and her team reached out with a challenge to try their hottest chicken wings, covered in what they ominously call their death sauce. Foolishly, we accepted. I'm breaking into like an actual sweat. Oh, jeez! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, okay. Oh. As we sweated and squirmed between sips of ice water and scoops of blue cheese, we got our first glimpse of the 191 Knickerbocker journey and the spirit that the team wanted to bring to the neighborhood. How would you describe the 191 Knickerbocker experience? What, what are you and the team trying to get for? Well, um, you know, the company's name is actually Big Humble. Thank you. Okay. The humble sign on this thing, so we're not trying to be pretentious or anything. It's a, it's a family-owned business, friends, and so on. Really want a chill type of vibe. And part of that, sorry, breaking up, you know, I'm still <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to get the words together to come out. That's Suni, the restaurant's general manager, wing sufferer, and longtime friend of Rona and Jesse. What he's referencing is the fact that the official company behind 191 Knickerbocker is called Big Humble LLC, a fitting name for a group whose every move here in the neighborhood has been guided by a tender humility in the face of trying to become a home for Bushwick's countless communities to gather in. Since sitting down for that original conversation, much has changed, both here in Bushwick and for the 191 Knickerbocker team. So today, we wanted to check in. To help us launch our new season, we caught up with Rona to reflect on the past year and unpack the lessons she's taken away from surviving one of the culinary world's toughest challenges this side of Death Sauce Chicken Wings, creating a restaurant from the ground up in one of New York City's most competitive food scenes. We were able to catch Rona in the middle of a typically busy day of prep, as the sounds of Jesse banging away in the kitchen echoed across the empty tables, which, in just a few hours, would be filled by hungry diners. We're actually a little, we're running a little late today because we had a, a late night last night. Um, typically we get here at noon. Um, he comes in, he gets to work on the tomato sauce. I run around like a headless chicken. I go to the restaurant store, catch up on some bookkeeping. Um, then I get back and I jump into the kitchen and I help him do some prepping. And then I leave, I go walk the dog and I come back and we're ready for dinner service. <laughs> Just over a year after serving their first meal, Rona and the 191 Knickerbocker team remain as ambitious as ever. But as Rona readily admits, the journey here has been full of humbling lessons on the realities of making life, love, and business work as new restaurateurs in a neighborhood that's changing faster by the day. The story of 191 Knickerbocker began about 10 years ago, when Rona and Jesse first met, fittingly while working together at a restaurant. I was a bartender, Um, he was a chef, he was the executive chef, Um, it was a little uh, mom and pop place in Queens in Astoria. Rona had grown up in Guyana and moved to the US in high school. Jesse had grown up in the Bronx. Both had been in the food service industry in the city in different roles for years by the time they crossed paths, but at that point, Rona was preparing to leave the restaurant world to return to college. Jesse'd had a crush on Rona for some time and feared that he'd never see her again. So when she turned in her two-week notice, he asked her on a date. It wasn't long after that they were married, sharing a co-op together in Queens, and developing a new life together as partners. Rona eventually finished school and worked an office job for several years while Jesse continued to hone his skills as an executive chef. Soon, an idea started to grow between them. What if they opened their own restaurant together? The idea became, as it does for so many aspiring restaurateurs, unignorable. And as Jesse puts it, in 2016, he and Rona decided to pull the pin and put everything on the line to bring that idea to life. In a city where the wrong business can be disruptive to a neighborhood, Rona and Jesse wanted to develop their restaurant the right way. And that meant creating a concept that was directly informed by the experiences and taste of the community they'd be building in. 
So they sold the co-op they shared in Queens and moved to Bushwick, where they began a process of integrating into the neighborhood first as residents to understand what their restaurant could bring to the table. We moved into the neighborhood um, to sort of experience it for ourselves and decide whether or not we want, you know, we if we were where were we were going to open. And we felt it was important to live there. And so it, when we moved to Bushwick, we hadn't, we hadn't signed a lease yet. We just, we moved here and we just um, did our, you know, we explored and looked around and then decided, yeah, this was it. This is where we wanted to be. After two years of learning their new home and exploring how they could contribute something unique and special to the neighborhood, Rona and Jesse developed the concept that would become 191 Knickerbocker, an international comfort food kitchen that celebrates the diverse communities that call Bushwick home while welcoming customers from any walk of life. Bushwick inspired us to kind of offer global comfort food and make it accessible to everyone, to everyone from all walks of life. Um, and, you know, we really want to cater to the people that lived here before, as well as the newcomers and just everyone. And um, that was one of the most important things to us, is to make it accessible to everyone and to be welcoming to everyone in the neighborhood. With this concept in mind, Rona and Jesse began the part of the process that they had the least experience with, finding a location and making it diner ready. Ultimately, they settled on an old deli at 191 Knickerbocker Avenue, a space that, while in a perfect location for their concept, would require a complete renovation to become operational. Rona and Jesse had spent years saving up the money and carefully developing the plan that would turn their dream into a reality. But they soon found that there was only so much they could do to prepare for the precarious and constant hustle of launching a brand new restaurant in Brooklyn. As an eater, it's easy to take for granted all the things that need to come together to support a full-service restaurant. Some things, like space for stovetops and hookups for sinks, may be obvious. Others, like exhaust ventilation systems and industrial capacity gas pipes, are less so. Opening a new restaurant, you can imagine, requires a lot of expertise and experience to fully account for each of the many details that need to fall into place before you can serve your first meal. While between them, Rona and Jesse had decades of experience managing the front and back of house operations of restaurants, they understood the limits of their own knowledge when it came to building out a new space. Where they could, they got help from family and friends. Rona's uncle, for instance, built the bar by hand, and they called in an engineer friend to design the restaurant sound system specifically to allow for easy, audible conversations. While it seemed in the earliest days of the project like things were going smoothly, the team soon hit a massive and unexpected challenge. Despite assurances from the architects they'd hired, the gas lines servicing the space weren't up to code. When we signed a lease, we had an architect come out here at least three times before signing just to confirm that everything was good to go and we had enough gas coming into the building. Um, we were told everything checked out. So we went ahead with construction. Uh, went ahead with construction, moved forward, we're building a bar, we're getting furniture, we're decorating, and then National Grid comes in to um, to, inst you know, to, to hook us up for gas and there is not enough gas coming into the building. While increasing the flow of gas to a new restaurant may sound straightforward, Rona and Jesse found that it was anything but. Quickly, it grew into a problem that catastrophically delayed the launch of the restaurant. So we've got to um, fill out an application for, for them to increase the pipe coming from the streets into the building and get a new gas meter. And so that took six months. For now, it took six, it was a six month waiting period, which we could not afford and did not know that that was gonna be the case. So that was one specific example of what hurted us because we weren't operational for those six months. And Jesse and I had already quit our jobs because we were here. And so we were screwed. They were able to stay productive by extending other aspects of the build-out, like the HVAC system and the finishing touches on the interior, but for the most part, they were forced to watch their rainy day money evaporate 
while they waited six months for the green light to open to customers. It was a time of great uncertainty because you're, it's like one foot in, one foot out. And you're like, wait, why are we, what, what are we doing? Why are we still working? Do we stop because we don't know if, you know, when National Grid's gonna, gonna come in, gonna come in. So it was very strange. It was a very strange experience. It's like, what are we doing and why are we even going forward? Thinking back to those early days, Rona says she feels that she was naive. We were, we were naive about everything. I mean, also, you know, going into it like any construction project, we had a contingency plan set aside, contingency funds, and within the blink of an eye, we just blew through everything. And because of problems or realizing that some, no, you know, this wasn't going to get done unless we did it, or hiring the wrong person for the job and then they did a shitty job and then you'd have to hire someone else to fix that problem. So things just spiraled out of control so quickly that opening day when we opened our doors, we, I think Jesse and I had $10 in our bank account. <laughs> a certain naivete seems almost essential to even accepting the challenge that is opening a new restaurant, let alone starting your first restaurant from scratch. After the break, We hear about the hustle of keeping a restaurant running in the face of constant challenges and the transformative power of surviving them. Today's program was brought to you by El Cortez, a colorful, bi-level restaurant in Bushwick, Brooklyn. El Cortez sports a bar on each floor, a patio for drinking zombies in the moonlight, and the capacity for just under a couple hundred revelers. New York Magazine's Chris Crowley profiled El Cortez, saying its owners aren't trying to mine Mexican restaurants of any era, but just mesh together a bunch of things that they like. The menu focuses on what they call all three Mexicans, hot plate, gringo, and Mexican Mexican. There's no fried chicken queso or chili con carne, but mission-style burritos, loaded all-American tacos, and a chimichanga. There's also a cheeseburger, because who cares? Cocktails lean heavily in the direction of tiki and the kind of low-brow drinks that caused the mixology revolution. Classic drinks your grandparents definitely drank, like the pina colada and rum punch, made with quality ingredients and a whole bunch of trial and error. Visit El Cortez at 17 Ingraham Street in Bushwick, or online at elcortezbushwick.com. After six months of slow progress, Rona, Jesse, and the team were able to resolve their gas issues and finally opened to the public in April of last year. For as exciting as the moment was for the people who'd been rooting for them, Rona and Jesse weren't quite ready to celebrate. It was extreme. It was like we went from zero to 100 in so many different ways, and an opening day probably should have been the most joyous, most proud moment in our lives, but it was the scariest because we were like, what, what, what are we even open? Once they were open, they attracted early interest from eaters throughout the neighborhood and across the city. But behind the scenes, it seemed like for every fire the team could put out, another would appear. You know, things go wrong. The ice machine could break during a busy Saturday night or um, the oven could, could not to decide not to work. You know, um, it it's unpredictable, and it's um, we had this winter um, we had a, a really cold week, and our our heating system decided to break, and so we had to close for a day. As Rona explains, in a machine as complex as a family restaurant, the real work lies not in preventing problems, but in how you adapt to handling them when they arise. Really, um, you just kind of have to put on a face, and even if the ice machine's broken during service, you know, the customers don't need to know. You just kind of have to, like, figure it out or or stall on some drinks or, you know, whatever the case is. Um, and it's about hustling. It's, it's really, it comes down to a hustle. So much of realizing the dream to open a new restaurant comes down to the courage and conviction to do something a little crazy. Opening yourself to the Public High Wire Act of balancing a hectic business with crowd-pleasing plates night after night. Rona is candid that, as animating as the power of a dream may be, it's hard not to ask yourself, should we even keep going? Oh, every month we have that conversation. <laughs> Just about every every other month or so. I mean, it's it's definitely it's something we think about all the time because we get we have an amazing week and then the next week is slow, and so. Um, you know, it, 
we're we're progressing in the way any restaurant should progress in their first six months or year, but because of how extreme our situation where was where we lost everything, you know, on, uh, by the time we're ready to open, we're playing catch up. That even though we're starting to do well and we're progressing as we should, it's it's still there's still so many challenges because we're recovering from a lot. Yet, for all the challenges and changes that Rona and Jesse have faced this year, what keeps them going seems to be the one thing that stayed constant, the support of the community. Even when we were doing construction and we weren't open yet, we had so many people um, just walking by and rooting for us to get through our problems. So nothing's really changed. It's all, it's all sort of remained the same. I, I don't know with... With all the challenges challenges we had, I, at the same time, there's some sort of charm that when you walk through that door, everyone's just, you know, have that quality and been so supportive. And um, it's just really touching to, to, to experience that. Rona and the team have watched as their customer base has steadily grown, powered almost entirely by word of mouth from customers turned evangelist by Jesse's menu. It's been amazing to see just the genuine uh, expression, um, and they they go out of their way to stop us and say, "Hey guys, great job," or or just keep it up, or like you know, I just I can't, you know, they go out of their way to tell us how amazing it is and how much they're spreading the word for us, or um, just their genuine excitement really is is what gets me. <laughs> Now at the start of year two, 191 Knickerbocker is beginning to feel like a true neighborhood staple, with regulars who return week after week. The home for comfort food and community that Rona and Jesse had dreamed it may one day become. It's been um, really amazing to watch. It's just a wide, it's, it's a wide range of age groups and ethnicity and backgrounds, and it's just, um, it's really diverse. And, you know, we have families we have couples that come in with their baby their you know their babies are um or children and we have millennials and we <laughs> we have um you know people that come in with their elderly parents and we have um middle-aged couples and and occasionally we'll get the blind dates um but it, it's been it's just been a wide a wide range Sitting down with Rona today, it's clear that her relationship to the space and the experience of opening it has transformed significantly over this past year. I feel proud of this establishment, but I'm also not attached in the sense where there's there's got to be a sense of detachment. And it's it's been an amazing stepping ground for us to give birth to other things. And um, it's definitely going to just open the doors. But, but it's... Not that it's going to open the doors. It's it's allowed me to open my doors or Jesse to open his doors and ide- open his our minds to other ideas. And um, it's just been a special experience in that way. While food remains paramount at 191 Knickerbocker, Rona and Jesse have begun what seems like a new phase in the project, using the space to build community beyond the dinner table. Rona, for example, is a writer, and she started hosting weekly Sunday night readings out of the dining space. I'm using this as a stepping ground um, to pursue the things I love to do. So Sunday nights, we're doing reading reading nights, and that's been taking off really well. Um, so we have a couple of poets, um, myself, and um, every week someone new joins the group. There's a saying with writers that goes something along the lines of, you spend your whole life writing your first novel, then you're freed to explore whoever you want to be on your second. It seems that after hustling so hard to finish out this first year at the restaurant, Rona is now beginning to embrace the possibilities that this next year may hold. After all the hurdles, um, you know, it's finally sinking in with us. Like, we did this, and we've never experienced, we never had a moment to experience. It would be, you know, like our family members and friends tell us we should be so proud, but we haven't really experienced that yet. Um, I think we're slowly starting to. Rona may look back at herself at the start of this journey as naive, 
But as she reflects on where the journey's brought her, it seems she hasn't lost any of the optimism that's propelled her this far. Instead, she's grateful for all that she's gained. I know now that I can still be a dreamer, but at the same time, I've got to be grounded and do and do and be practical. And um, you know, when it comes to artists, for example, that writer side of me is just like such a dreamer, and I'm like, I'm just gonna jump in and I'm gonna do this. And and you know, what are we without taking a risk? But at the same time, this experience has made me realize it's got to be another side to it. Like you've got to be practical and be realistic about challenges and find that balance. In the upcoming year, who knows? The future may even take the spirit of 191 Knickerbocker far beyond Bushwick. What comes next um, is trying to produce uh, my mom's hot sauce. <laughs> so that's our next uh, our next project. Um, it's sort of a family tradition. My mom's been making this hot sauce her whole life, and her mother before was making this hot sauce her whole life. And so when, um, when Jesse came to visit my parents for the first time this is like a staple in in my parents home it sits on the kitchen counter always and he loves spicy food and he's he has he's passionate about hot sauces so he had it and he was like blown away and so my mom and him got together and they've been working out the kinks for this recipe and people have been loving it so we put it on the table in the restaurant um, to just sort of kind of get feedback, and customers just can't get enough of it. A couple bottles have gone missing. <laughs> so um, and there's been uh, there's there's been a lot of requests for us to start selling it, and um, that's that's our next project is how do we how do we produce this hot sauce and manufacture it and sell it. <laughs> Today, at least, Rona is focused on how to put the experiences of 191 Knickerbockers past year to service for other people in the community. She's networking with Bushwick business owners and is in the early stages of creating a merchants association for the neighborhood. Looking ahead, Rona emphasizes in a characteristically big, humble fashion that she's always available to help other entrepreneurs in any way she can. I'd like to say that my door is always open. Um, anyone who has an inkling to want to create something or start something or whether it's a restaurant or a retail store or whatever it is like if not me and I'm doubt this was just my first so please maybe not me but just ask questions and and talk to people and network and you know you'd be really surprised at how uh, willing people are to to give advice and and, and um, people are eager to share share their experiences you just have to ask yeah if you're interested in learning more about 191 knickerbocker or trying some of the best comfort food this side of your grandma's house for yourself you can find their menu at 191 knickerbocker.com or learn more on their instagram at 191 underscore knickerbocker we've got all the information in our show notes for this week's episode We'd like to extend our sincere thanks to Rona, Jesse, Suni, and the rest of the Big Humble family. And as always, we'd like to thank you for listening this week. We're thrilled to be kicking off our most ambitious season yet, and we're so grateful to have you come along for the ride. If you enjoy Bushwick Podcast, you can do us a huge favor by telling a friend, or even by leaving us a review on iTunes, which helps us reach even more new listeners. We'll be back with another story next week. In the meantime, if you have any questions, comments, or want to get involved, send us an email to hello at hearbushwick.com. That's H-E-A-R bushwick.com. Or you can always DM us on our Instagram page at Bushwick Podcast. And we can't wait to hear from you. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please 
Join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.